Welcome to this episode of Let's Chat. I'm your host, Chris Revel, coming to you from the Cat Cave in Warwick, Rhode Island. Let's Chat is a conversational podcast where I, host Chris Revel, invite people from the world of punk rock, podcasting, and pop culture. And today's guest is really the perfect Venn diagram of all of those things. We've got comedian, actor, podcaster, uh, author, and all-around awesome dude, Chris Gethard. Uh, what a... I, I can't even I can't even tell you how important this episode was for me. This was uh, just just really it, it it means a lot. This was Chris Gethard is someone I'm just a huge fan of uh, as a comedian. Turns out he's also grew up in the New Jersey scene, so like it's like the perfect Venn diagram of someone who loves comedy and punk music and um, also like talks a lot about behavioral health and mental health and you know his entire he has an entire special about a suicide attempt I I've worked in uh, the behavioral health field for the last decade I work at a psychiatric hospital in my day job and um, it was really special to get to talk to him I've been listening to him on podcasts for years I've been watching him on TV I mean I've seen him in the office he's in uh, you know, he's on Parks and Rec. I remember seeing him for like a kind of like cameo and the other guys and just getting super excited or the heat. I, I didn't get to ask him about it, but I know he was cut out of one of the uh, Marvel movies. I remember hearing him uh, mention that on Blank Check. And um, one thing I always think about is like there's two podcasts that I really like kind of I two podcasts I absolutely love and always want this show to almost kind of be like if you had a baby, if this podcast came out of two podcasts, it would be going off track and blank check with Griffin and David. I'm super happy to say I've gotten to interview, uh, Steven and Jonah back when they were hosting going off track. And then more recently, Benny Horowitz, who is now hosting, uh, going off track. Griffin Newman has been on here from blank check. And like, those are the podcasts. I just feel like this show is like a mixture of like, uh, nerds who love music and comedy a ton. So this, this episode was, I, I didn't know where to start. There's so many things to talk about uh, with Chris Gethard. I mean, the fact, you know, his podcast, Be- Beautiful Anonymous, uh, all of his amazing work. He's had this long career of, when we talk about it, about you know, being at UCB and watching everyone kind of jump ahead of him. It's so great now to see him, like, land where he has. Um, one of the really cool things about this episode was the night before we recorded, he was on Conan. So I got to go around work and look pretty cool to be like, hey, no big deal. Uh, me and Conan are interviewing the same person this week. And the one person I work with, a uh, shout out Adam, who actually knows who Conan is, was really excited. So that was pretty funny. Um, yeah, this is I, I, I remember like before we did this episode, I did a lot of prep and I just wrote down everything I wanted to talk to Grethard about. And the three things that I really, really wanted to talk to him about were uh, growing up in the New Jersey punk scene, his role in the movie Don't Think Twice, and career suicide, and I believe his special, and we got to do all of those things. And, you know, he was super open and honest and just so generous and kind. I got to give a big shout out to Jay Vix from the New Jersey Pop Punk 1994 to 2002 group on Facebook. Join it if you're a fan of music, of uh, punk, of uh, any of that scene kind of stuff. It's really fun. A lot of nice people in there. But that's uh that's how Gethard and I got connected. I remember seeing Gethard doing a um cover of Weston for the Jersey Interchange, and I was like, oh my god, how cool is that? And then he was also on an episode of This Was the Scene. It's a podcast that kind of grew out of that that I really liked too. I'm like, wow, Gethard's like pretty involved in like the the Jersey scene. Like I knew he was from New Jersey and grew up in the punk scene, but I didn't really realize how involved. So that was that was really cool. And, um, you know, Christian, who started the Jersey Interchange, he's a past guest. He came on with uh, Heath Serencino from uh, Midtown and Census Fail. That was a great episode if you're if you like that kind of stuff. So this was cool. I, I, I was really happy about how we got to get to everything. I'm like growing up in the New Jersey scene. Uh, I mean, I could hear him talk about touring with Mike Birbiglia and what led to Don't Think Twice, which would lead to career suicide. Like, forever. I mean, Don't Think Twice is one of my favorite movies. I, I'm a huge Mike Birbiglia fan of his comedy and his his, his films. Uh, but then, like, you know, Chris Gethard, Gillian Jacobs, Michael Keegan Key, Kate McCucci, Birbiglia is in it. Um, even Aaron Maya Drake is in it. Like, it's it's such a good movie. I just, I love that movie so much. It's honestly one of my favorite movies. So getting to talk about to Gethard about it. And, you know, that movie, like, I, I just assume was about his life and getting to kind of find out some of his stories uh, made it in there was really great. You know, I, I love Chris Gethard because he's someone like some of my friends, like my friend, um, my friend and old super, my, my former supervisor, Nikolai, is uh, I remember telling me one day at work to watch a stand up special, uh, Career Suicide. And I absolutely love that special. And Chris was really awesome to talk about it with me and talk about his suicide attempt. It was, you know, it's pretty special. But, you know, I 
it was like, oh, Nikolai, you know who that is? That's so cool. And then Gethard's also another person that, like, my brother, my shout out Aaron, was, like, a fan of because he's a, we're both huge fans of the podcast, uh, Blank Check with Griffin and David, and, and Gethard's, uh, Gethard, Gethard's on that podcast quite a lot. So he's just kind of one of those people who's in all these different little niches of, of all the fandoms of things that I love. And for him to say yes and come chat to me was really nice. So, um, Gethard has a new podcast out right now called uh, New Jersey is the World, which you can check out. He's also pretty probably a more well-known podcast, which probably needs no introduction, would be Beautiful Anonymous. You could check that out as well. Um, just ChrisGeth.com, you'll find everything. I mean, this dude's written books. He's in everything. But New Jersey is the World, what he was nice enough to come here to talk to us about. You know, it's a free monthly podcast, and you can subscribe, but they also have a Patreon with, like, an insane amount of content, which is pr- and for pretty low prices, and it's all about the insane stories of growing up in New Jersey, the food, the places, and it's it's really fun. I've been really enjoying it, especially as someone who's a huge Jersey fan. Also, check out Planet Scum, PlanetScum.live, that's where you'll see the George Lucas talk show, um, which shout out Griffin. And then, um, you know, Planet Scum is a new online comedy venue that uh, Chris Gethard helped build, born out of the pandemic. It's basically, a, a, it's it's awesome. So much great comedy is going on there every night uh, on the internet. So it's so great to see people like him uh, adjust and, and figure out through the pandemic. Oh, before we do anything, I have to say a huge thank you to to Robbie Dorman. Uh, Robbie is uh, a friend of the show. Uh, he's fellow podcast host. He hosts a podcast called Conversations with Robbie. You can follow that on Twitter at with Sherman. Follow him at Robbie Sherman, or you can check him out on Bandcamp and uh, all that stuff you can find through his Twitter. Or you can check him out on his uh, Bandcamp, which is Robbie Sherman. 2112.bandcamp.com You know what? We'll put all these links right in the show notes for you to make it a little easier. But thank you for Robbie for uh, editing this episode for us. Uh, make sure you check me out on our other uh, video podcast, Let's Chat Live, which I co-host with uh, my, my business partner and friend of Let's Chat Media, Bree Benjamin. Uh, we rotate our host. Uh, make sure you follow us more if you're interested in joining our Let's Chat Club. Our Let's Chat Club is an online community where it empowers content creators, creatives to monetize their passion project while making industry connections. Let's Chat Club helps creatives build and strengthen their brand, build infrastructure to succeed. We offer classes, networking opportunities. We have a wide array of expertise to help you with all of your content needs. Uh, that's been a lot of fun. We've been we're going to be having our very first um, event as a group with um, Nikolai, my my, supervi- my old supervisor. I shout out earlier is going to be t- doing a class on burnout, and we're going to be doing a lot more stuff. If you have any interest in uh, want, if you want to help support the show financially, which we greatly appreciate, because if someone needs new equipment, me, but also it would just mean a lot. Um, you can check out buymecoffee.com slash let's chat media. We also got merch, tpublic.com slash let's chat podcast. We'll put all of this in the show notes. And uh, I was recently a guest on Defining Disney, which are Let's Chat Club members, and we got to cover Lady and the Tramp, and it was a really fun episode. So please check that out if you can. And I was just also on another uh, Let's Chat Club members podcast, Cyber Tide Bite. I'll let you know when that goes up on the Twitter, at Let's Chat Podcasts and all the things, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You know, give us a follow. Everything you can find is Let's Chat Podcast.net. Let's get to it. In a world with two brothers, six bottles, and endless opinions, comes a comedy podcast tale as old as time. The Half Hour Bros podcast has been hailed as so funny, you have to hear it to believe. Join Kurt and Tom as they talk beer, reviews, and the world as they see it through their slightly drunker eyes. The Half Hour Bros podcast is streaming on almost all major platforms. At Half Hour Bros Pod for the Twitter and email halfhourbros at gmail.com. So this is so cool because, like, uh, so I've been a big fan of yours for a while, but, like, I first learned about you from, like, uh, comedy, specifically, like, comedy podcast, especially, like, that early, like, what, 2010, like, when, I don't know, when I remember that back then, like, maybe 2009, when it was, like, uh, the whole, like, oh, you missed the boom, comedy podcasts are over. Wait, were they wrong? Yeah. And then, uh, 
And then so it was always so funny. And like, and I'd always like just really like felt like your comedy. And then it was just so funny because like you would just then like and here you start talking about like punk rock stuff. I was like, oh my god, because I'm sure as you know, there's such a small Venn diagram of like seeing kids and comedians yeah. and like. Uh, my comedy friends and like you like pop up in like front bottom videos and stuff like that i was like oh that's so crazy so that was always it was so funny because i always felt like i had my like my comedy nerd friends and then like my scene music friends and like very rarely did we ever lap it's like me and kyle canane help bridge the gap yes yes you and kyle yeah i i think i've seen him i know remember he did towards the falcon but i couldn't make that but i had gotten to see him uh oh tour as well and it's fucking dope it's so crazy uh yes so and then you know and also being a jersey person where where in jersey are you actually from i grew up in west orange okay so my my wife is from bloomfield mm -hmm. but but like i grew up in connecticut but um i went to um, there's no i doubt you never heard of it there's a summer camp i used to work at and then go to when i was younger in warwick new york but it was on like the vernon new jersey line and so like everyone there was from jersey so like my whole life growing up everyone like crapped on jersey but um when i ever thought of jersey it was like sussex county <laughs> which you know the most like beautiful place in the entire yeah, world yeah and then like at that time i just had like started getting in like punk rock and stuff and it was always so strange to me and like my experiences in new jersey were like um even i'd always the joke was like even the bros knew who bigwig was like even the bros would know who bigwig was which always like cracked me up yeah yeah, they were uh, pretty omnipresent back in my day. Although I first saw, I remember seeing Tom Petta originally when he was uh, one of the guitarists for a band called Felix Frump, which was actually, they actually played the first show I ever saw. So I uh, I remember him from before Big Wig. And then it was, it was just so cool. It was really cool growing up there. And you could see a band like Big Wig, like actually catch momentum. And it's like, they were just, playing American Legion halls, just like all the other bands, like three months ago, what's going on here? No, dude, it's, it's nuts. It's like, it's, it's so crazy, especially if it's looking like 20 years, what have, how many, maybe 20 years, like looking back at that scene of like, what would become of it. And like, you know, some of the, like, you know, even like, like, you know, Jack Antonoff, you know, be, and like becoming like one of the working with Taylor Swift or even like Mike Hem being MTV. And, you know, I'm from Connecticut. So like we grew up on the outskirts of like the Jersey scene. So we get to see all you guys, all you Jersey cats come up our way. And then we, we befriended these who happy to say still friends to this day, this band Folly. They were from Sussex County with a kind of hardcore ska metal band. And then like, so we would always travel down to your world and uh, go to all your shows. And it was, oh, it's fucking, fucking awesome. Yeah. It was a cool way to grow up. And, uh, like the older I get and the more that I touch base with people of my generation, the more I realized that it was, it was really, really informative for a lot of us and in ways that I think have extended and lasted beyond just being music fans or, or messing around and being in bands. I just think I look back at Jersey and I realize it, it was a really high concentration of kids who were mobilized, like, everybody was in a band or booking spaces to put on shows or putting on fanzines or, you know, putting together comps on these tiny little record labels they'd start. And, and everybody, I'm talking like everybody doing those things would be sometimes like 15, 16 years old, like really on the young end. So I actually, I actually think there's a lot of us, a lot of people I've met who had associations with that scene where it's just, they kind of became people who hustle and people who grind and, people who really kind of like know how to merge artistic ideas or outlandish ideas with like a real blue collar work ethic. I think that's all related to like being in Jersey and just everybody being like, screw it, we'll do it ourselves from, from day one. I didn't even realize yeah. growing up how unusual that was and how empowering that was. Oh yeah. I remember like I had a friend of mine in college who was from, I forget where, but like outside Chicago, like four or five hours outside Chicago, maybe like Minnesota or something. And it, like him, like he was so perplexed by the idea of like the basement scene because like where he lived or even my like friends in California is like, they just didn't have basements just like, you know, like, <laughs> which was just so weird to me. And he's like, you, what, you had shows every weekend. I had to drive like five hours to Chicago to see like outline trio. And, and this is, you know, Connecticut, but like, you know, even like on the outside perspective, um, you could even, I remember even at that time, like really, you could feel something special being in New Jersey. Like I remember like going to the first time, 
remember the first time going to New Brunswick and just like, oh my God, like you, you would, it was just like, it was just so strange. Or like you'd be driving, I remember one time I was, I had to go to a funeral and I remember we drove by the Wayne Firehouse, which, you know, some regular, I've yeah. never been there. But I've heard legend of it, and like driving by, and my dad be like, "Oh my god!" <gasps> He's like, "What?" I'm like, e- "Whatever." Yeah, it's so wild to me. Like the Wayne Firehouse Skaters World is another one that I feel like people have heard about, and you're like, "It's Skaters World." Like, it's just kids booking shows, and then New Brunswick. I went to Rutgers, and and uh, that scene was always so cool. It actually, sadly, was kind of in a valley. You know, there's peaks and valleys to it, and and the the years I was there, the Lifetime guys had a house that closed the year I got there. They stopped doing shows. And then they, there's a bar called the Melody Bar that, that was around for my first year in New Brunswick. It got knocked down. So I think the music scene was taking some hits. Um, but New Brunswick is such a beat up town. Yeah. And you know what's really weird is you talk to a lot of people who are associated with the New Brunswick scene. And I think they'll tell you, like, in they were simultaneously like the best years of your life in the sense of like, you know, that whole attitude that leads to a basement scene of like, we'll do it ourselves. We'll do it underground. If the cops want to come and shut it down, they have to find it first, but we're going to put up cool stuff and it's going to have a place. But then a lot of people, I think would also say their years spent in New Brunswick were simultaneously some of the worst years of their life. Cause it's like a very depressing town. And I think probably a lot of the good art is almost a reaction to that. I, I think there's probably something to be studied by some sociologist who's smarter than I am about like, why has so much good music come out of New Brunswick, New Jersey? And I think you go, oh, it's like a town where you can get lost. It's a town where it's real beat up. It's a town where there's a lot of meatheads and a lot of townies. And being the weirdo artistic kid, like you have to link up with the other people who feel like that in order to, and and the best nights of your life are like hanging out in like a bed bug infested yep. house that should be condemned. And those are like the best nights, like drinking 40s with bed bugs. Yeah, Stoops. people are going to have to make good art and it's going to be art that has an edge and some anger in it because that's the town you're in. But I look at it and go, man, like I started there in 98. So I remember when I was a kid, two of the biggest bands to us were the Bouncing Souls, obviously out of New Brunswick, and then Weston, who we always looked at them as like two companion bands. Weston would come from Pennsylvania, but I always felt like we're kind of honorary Jersey. They played there so much. And you know, I got there in 98 and you'd see, you'd walk past the house and it was just no, like, Oh, that's the house where the bouncing souls used to live. And then you see, oh, yeah. it's just such a clear lineage. That's so cool too, where it pretty clearly goes from bouncing souls to lifetime, to the ergs, to screaming females. And you're like, Oh, this town has always kind of had like a standard bearer and they, they've always managed to lift up other bands with them and make this town. That's, that's kind of in many, many ways, kind of just like a shitty little town that should be a blip on the radar. Like bands should not want to stop there. Like you got New York, you got Philly. It's it's very strange. And then I've heard stories that there's bands that will actually like come from Europe and make a point of playing a New Brunswick basement show just because they've heard so much about that scene and they've heard the Lifetime album with that song on it. And I'm going, people are coming from like Denmark and they want to play a basement in New Brunswick. That's wild to me. It's wild. But again, like having been a tangential part of it back in the day, having been at a lot of the shows that were kind of swirling around when that happened, I go, oh, right. But I also know dozens of people, some of whom I knew then, some of whom I come to find out later were probably at the same shows I was, where you go, oh, yeah. And then we all walked away and became, like, I don't want to say fighters because it has violent connotations, but as mm. far as like our approach to life and career and, and, um, uh, all sorts of things in that realm of, of sort of like self-determination. You go, oh, a lot of fighters came out of that scene. Like a lot of people were ready to throw down and carve something out for themselves. And I'm, I'm lucky to be amongst that number. Yeah. I, I feel like at least for me, like when I found when I started my, I started this show back in 2013, like it replaced what the scene culture was for me from back then. Like <clears throat> I, I didn't realize that I got older, how many DIY ethics I held with me as I went on. It's just like, no, just, just do it. You just, you just, I mean, I, I know it's do it yourself, but obviously it's like you have a community and a network of people. And I, you know, it's and funny too. Like I, I talk about this all the time. Like I remember the first time I ever learned about like animal rights or like, uh, like feminism or like, I guess like more progressive ideals would be like from, there's this dude in Connecticut would always like have like a a vegan straight edge dude with a boatload of tattoos, giant earrings. And he was also a magician. 
I know just cause that's how it was. And he yeah. would be like handing out pamphlets about like activism and stuff. And I was like, wait, what? Like, I don't know. I know it was in what, like 17 or 18. Like just, I, th- I think I actually, I'm, I'm pretty sure I remember this right, but I'm pretty sure I registered to vote at a Knights of Columbus hall in Connecticut in Walter, Connecticut, like a, at like a, like a, a hate breed show or something like that. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, okay. I guess voting's important. Similar. And- like I, I remember when I was a kid, one of the big things was there were flyers, um, by ARA, Anti-Racist Action, they were omnipresent at shows, and, and they were basically, you'd get like a Xeroxed back then sheet, and it would just list, like, here's Nazi symbology, here's stuff that relates to this, here's ways you can know if there's Nazi punks at your show. Mm-hmm. And it was always a thing that we'd have, and you'd look, and you'd see, oh, this guy with the shaved head has some patches on his sleeve, and I saw that on that flyer. This is bad. we got to get this guy out of here. We're going to get... In- you know, this is going to be trouble. And that was like a real thing back then. And I, and then I remember when Antifa started making so much waves, when I read up on it, I don't know, I haven't researched it much, but my understanding is they kind of are a mutation um, of anti-racist action where I go, those guys were doing good stuff when I was 14 years old. Yeah, like, that's great. As a fourteen year, because you know, I, I I'm lucky. I grew up in a town where, uh, it, it's actually one of the most diverse towns in America. I've I've read, and and there's, I take a lot of pride in that. I grew up around a, a ton of different people. Same. But to get a flyer that's like, there's going to be people who show up at your shows. They're going to have bad intentions. Here's how you know who they are. Here's what this symbol means. Here, if you see this thing with these lightning bolts, that means that they're shouting out this group, and this group started in Idaho, and here's all the fucked up shit they've done. And if somebody comes in and they're, you know, they they have Doc Martens on, and the laces are a certain color, like that's all the red, stuff we yeah. used to hear. Like red means this, blah blah blah. And yep. here's how you know if a skin has a sharp, who you can should have at your show. And it's like that's not just. It's it's very inspiring, right? Because this is no longer a school lesson where they show you like a film strip about a speech made 30 years ago. This is, hey, this is happening not just in your world, not just in your country, not just in your state, not just in your town. This might be happening in the room that you're in right now. And it's your fucking job to say something about it or do something about it. It might be happening right in front of you. So look out for it and do something about it. And what a good lesson to be taught as a kid. It, it, it's so it's so funny too because I'm I'm loving your new podcast that uh, New Jer- New Jersey is uh, New Jersey is the world and because like obviously I like love the punk connection stuff but like I always felt that way about New- coming from New Jersey because everyone shit on it I always loved like absolutely loved I've spent so much time there because of like I've been going there to like you know Vernon and all these little towns that no one ever heard of and it's all like beautiful lake houses and stuff and then I've spent a lot of time in North Jersey as well but like it's New Jersey is a weird state, and I think your podcast is exploring that so well. Like, I mean, New Jersey is like a, it's like a microcosm of like United States. You have the rural, you have urban, you have like a little bit of everything, but it's and it's so densely, con- so small and condensed. And um, do you, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, you used to work for uh, the Weird New Jersey, is that right? Yeah, I, from from the year 2000 to about 2004, I worked for them full time. And then after that, they would contract me to work on a bunch of stuff regarding their book series. I love those books. I was kind of getting more into the, I was getting more opportunities in the entertainment world. So I had to stop working for them full time. But then they were like super cool about giving me work um, along the way. And again, like just another, another thing that I look back and I go, that's, it's unbelievable to me that I was going to these shows and then. I was their only employee for a long time. It was the two guys who owned it and me. And I'm sitting here going, man, this shouldn't work. These guys shouldn't be able to pay their mortgages off of a magazine about haunted trees. Like, this is an unlikely idea. And these guys are making it work. And the way they're making it work, like, they hired me. I was their first employee. Before that, the owners would drive the boxes of the magazines to Borders Books and Barnes & Noble. And they'd go back. Can can I talk to the periodicals manager? Hey, we got to how do we get this on your show? Like they do it themselves. They literally drive there themselves, drop off the boxes. They drive to their distributors, pick up the cash in hand from these people, like no middlemen. And 
just again another example of that jersey thing DIY. just like go do it go do it and not diy as a buzzword do ya why is like an actual like nobody else is gonna do it so go do literally it. my career has been very weird and comedy and it, it constantly has like peaks and then valleys and what i always find is I, I find so often that a lot of people and a lot of my friends a lot of people i came up with like they hit a certain level and then they stay there I tend to hit certain levels and then kind of crash back down and then always realize like, okay, here's another phase where people are kind of writing me off or doubting me. Well, time to start, you know, time to start doing my mail order myself. Time to start, mm -hmm. you know, with, like with New Jersey is the world. We did like a give a membership card giveaway to, uh, to like the first month, whoever signed up to the Patreon of the first month. And like, I licked almost 300 <clears throat> envelopes myself and went to the post office and dropped them off. And I take great pride in that. But it's also like, you know, I had a TV show three years ago. Like most people who hosted a TV show in 2018 are licking 300 stamps in 2021. But right. that's, I wouldn't have it any other way. I, I'd feel uncomfortable doing it any other way. It's, it's uh, the way I grew up is just you do it yourself and you get your hands dirty or else you have no right to complain uh, if yeah. it's not happening. Absolutely. And I, you know, I remember listening, like you were one of those like first early like podcast guests I would listen to. Like, I didn't know who you were, but you'd be on like, you made it weird or something. I'm like, all right. Oh, and then like, you know, especially then, like there weren't as many podcasts. Like if I, I'd like the guests and I'd just go listen to them and everywhere I could find them. And um, it was, it's so interesting now just kind of see like at least, Back in that era, I remember listening to you, and I remember even I got to interview. I think you must know Jeff Garlock, and mm -hmm. like, yeah, like uh, yeah, another comedian, uh, yeah. no, comedian musician. He played more kid for anyone. Podcast that. about music too. Worst gig, yeah, it's actually I found him from Worst Gig Ever with Worst Gig Ever, and then it actually turned out that we were we grew up the town next to each other, and so did Sean Clemens, who I got to interview oh, yeah. as well. Sean's an old friend of mine. From uh, they're both from Cheshire. I'm from Meriden, Connecticut. But like we never had crossed paths until you know years later virtually. But isn't that just it's such a small world like that? But like I just remember every uh, interview and every everything you would talk about. You were always like the guy who was uh, the teacher, and then everyone kind of passed passed you oh, on yeah. in so, some level. Story of my life. And but then it's cool now to kind of see like like I mean you were on Conan what like I think yesterday I was watching you on Conan. I was yeah, at work bragging. Ago, yeah, yeah. I was bragging at work. I'm like no big deal. Talking to someone, me and Colin have the same guests this week. <laughs> happy to happy to make you uh, score some cool points there. Yeah, I, I work at a psychiatric hospital, so not a single person knew what I was talking about. Oh, <laughs> They're good, like, well, good, good. What, what's a Conan? I'm like, yep, like pop yeah. culture gets lost on half the people I work with, unfortunately, which is always clever. But it's just always so cool now to kind of see like you were the underdog, and now you're like you landed at a really cool spot, and like, yeah, but it's funny because it's it's this weird thing where I'm like. I, I recognize that I'm successful and I've done some stuff, but I still also every, when I say literally every day, sit around with imposter syndrome, sit around wondering where the next gig is coming. It's every day. Part of that is because I've chosen to do it my own way. Uh, part of that is my own mental, you know, stuff that I've had to spend a lot of time sorting out, but it's cool. It's like, I'm like, thank you. I did land in a good place, but I still feel like that underdog. And maybe that's also something that I kind of need to internally hang on to in order to keep going. Yeah. Once that goes away, I think it's when you get lazy, right? You know? Uh, well, I mean, yeah. you're one of the people, like, even like Perbiglia too, like when the pandemic hit, I saw a lot of people just like, um, you know, we didn't have a choice. So like people couldn't tour and it sucks, but some people like you were one of the, like with the, like we do like the, with the planet scum and stuff. It's just like, you're like, all right, I'm going to do this. Whatever obstacle you throw in my way, you tell me I can't tour, then I'm going to jump on the internet. You're like, I can't have a TV show. I'll do community access. And I, I just, I love, I just love that. I think it's so badass. Thanks. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta throw yourself. You gotta run into a hundred walls until you find the one that actually falls down. Right. Yeah. And you know, it's, I, I always wanted to ask you cause um actually so one of my favorite movies was uh, don't think twice. Um, when you got that script, were you like, Mike, were you like, did you write this about me? Well, it's funny. I, uh, I actually opened for Mike for all of 2014, I think. Nice. Yeah. I'd been doing comedy a long time, but mostly improv. And I'd spent a few years transitioning over to stand up, and I was getting pretty good. Um, but I knew I was like, I was like, 
Per Bigley is just like doing it at his own level, you know? So I, I knew to be humble. And I actually, where was it? I got booked to do the Comedy 10 at Bonnaroo. And he did it as well. And he saw me tell a story. He's like, dude, you're getting good. He's like, you're getting good. I've always known you as an improviser. And right away I knew, I was like, thanks, man. I was like, if you ever need an opener, just keep me in mind. And then a few months later he reached out and we'd be on these, uh, you know, long drives like any anybody who's ever toured, no, like you're driving from Iowa City to Wichita in the middle of the night, like not much to do except talk. And he kept picking my brain, and then, you know, I'd pick it. We talk comedy a lot, we talk life a lot, and then after a certain point, I realized he's asking about the old days at UCB a bunch. Like he's asking me about what it was like when Bobby Moynihan got SNL and Zach Woods got The Office, and and I didn't get anything. Like and after a bunch of it, I was just like, why is it like? you're really into this topic. He's like, well, I'm writing a screenplay and I think, I think this might have some value in it. So if you see on that movie, he actually gave me some sort of like, um, story collaborator credit, like some, something just to recognize like, yeah, like I did give him some raw material there. And he always jokes. He's like, he's like, uh, he's like in a lot of ways you helped you helped me. How does he phrase it? Cause I don't ever want to take credit away from him. Like it's his thing. He wrote the script. I'd be at the readings. I'd throw in ideas. Sometimes I'd be able to go like, Oh, this thing happened at UCB once. That's kind of legendary. That could show up in there, but it's just spitball. But he's always kind of been like, you know, you helped me build. Don't think twice. And then I helped you build career suicide. And, uh, I think he'll always say stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, I think we can call that an even trade, man. Like, and he did a lot more for career suicide than I did for don't think twice, but there's a few lines. There's a few lines in that movie. One in particular, that's uh, an, an actual quote that I told him that was, uh, that, that was something I said to, uh, to someone who got very successful. (laughs) That was just verbatim in the movie. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I watched it again last night just because, like, I just been. I knew we were doing this, and I was like, and I just, I just really love that movie. I just, I, I just love that movie so much. And you had some meaty scenes too. Yeah, I was surprised, man. He asked me to do some heavy lifting. It was, it was very flattering. My, my yeah, wife, there's, the, there's my that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh no, the, there's a scene in there where, uh, where Keegan's character says, "Like, I was so close to getting it," and I'm sitting here going, "Man." if I don't get this, I might kill myself. And then mm-hmm. I look back and I'm like, oh, if you still had to live our lives. And that was, uh, in 2007, I was a guest writer at SNL for two weeks. And then I didn't get the job long term. And especially back then, I was only seven years in. It felt to me like I'd blown my one shot, you know? Yeah. And then about, I forget exactly when Bobby got SNL. It's maybe like a year or so after that. Like still when it was a fresh wound. And he's one of my best friends and he had no ill intentions. He, I think he just straight up forgot that I had that two week thing. And when he, and to be fair, that show fucks with people's heads bad and they really play a cat and mouse game. And for all of us, it was like, are they going to hire him or not? Like, why are they fucking with his head? And then they hired him and it went on to be this, you know, he was on that show forever, really great run. But when he got it, he goes, Oh, it's such a relief. He's like, dude, it was fucking with my head so bad. I'm going, man, if I don't get this job, I might, I might fucking kill myself. And I didn't say it, but I'm sitting there going, I didn't get the job last year. I didn't get the job. It was just last year. But I wasn't going to fucking, I wasn't going to be a wet blanket on my friend. You know, we were celebrating, but it always made me laugh. And I think I circled back with him and we laughed about it um, because I do enjoy a dark laugh. But that moment was like a direct, a direct like, oh, for bigs, this, (laughs) listen to this conversation. And then that one showed up in the script. (laughs) <laughs> that's so crazy well i'm so curious of like what do you think about was it do you think it's um like doing like therapy or all that like inner self-work that like you didn't turn into like mike's character in the movie where you just kind of like hated everyone like who kind of jumped above you like it seems like you had the wherewithal to be like maybe i'm sure you had some jealousy like any normal person oh, but yeah. still like not like you know, bobby's still your friend to this day you know yeah yeah you know you could you could have really that self-sabotage and behavior like uh, i'm also in there you know therapy is a wonderful wonderful thing yeah i'm with you and and i mean you work it, it you said you work in a psychiatric hospital so i know you're like 
up yeah, close oh, yeah. with all sorts of iterations of stuff I can imagine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was hard and there was definite bitterness. There's definite anxiety. Um, other people's success was becoming like a albatross that was hanging over a, around my neck. And I think a lot of people have been there. And then I also think when you get older, you start to realize how their success doesn't really equate. It doesn't really have anything to do with you, you know? Yeah. Um, like it's an ecosystem and you play your part in it. But yeah, I mean, there was a stretch that was getting very dangerous for me where uh, those two guys, Bobby and Zach, had moved on, and like I said, they were they were they were the two guys I was tightest with in comedy at that time, amongst another handful of people, you know. But they were like the inner circle to those members for sure. Mm. And when they got it, and everybody was telling me, "Oh, you're next," and then it just wasn't happening. There were uh, two incidents. One that was really scary to everybody who was there that night, where I was about to go on stage, and I I, I was in the green room, and and the really bad one. I was in the green room and I stood up off this couch to walk on stage and I just froze and I couldn't walk. And my friends who were with me were like, what's going on? You got to go on stage, man. And then they looked and I just was like uncontrollably sobbing. And I was developing all these mental blocks about even going on stage, which was becoming this vicious cycle of like self-questioning and, yeah. you know, like, really beating the shit out of myself and, and driving my own sense of self-worth down. But there's a few things that happened. One, after that incident was when I started with a shrink for real, um, dove back into it after a few years off. And she really helped. She really, even to this, uh, even, to, even to this day, a lot of what she has become is like, as I'm more stable, she's almost like less of a traditional shrink and more of a career counselor where I'm like, oh, this seemed, was this more worth my time or is that more worth my time and really trust her on it. And then I'll never forget another thing that happened, which was I was once in a green room at the UCB theater and it, these two guys were off in a side room talking and I was the third one to arrive that night. So I was just sitting on the couch and I wasn't eavesdropping. They were just loudly talking and they didn't know I was there um but I hear one of them going oh man like I just moved my family out to LA and now I got a gig here I don't know if I should move them back because what if I what if I lose the gig and and then you know I got to move them back to LA and I don't want my kids having to switch schools and then the other guy's going yeah like I have no idea when my job's gonna end and I really don't know what's next on the horizon I feel like I should be looking for more stuff but I'm being lazy about it and these two guys, one of them was at the time a correspondent on The Daily Show and another was in the cast of Saturday Night Live and had been for years. And it was actually, their anxiety and stress was actually very freeing for me because I was sitting there looking at it going, man, those are two jobs that I always assumed if you get those jobs, like you're good to go and you feel good about yourself finally and you've accomplished things and and that's victory. And I'm sitting there realizing, oh, this shit's never going to go away. Like I have to stop approaching my career as if I'm going to accomplish something that can solve my problems because professional accomplishments, that's not what they're there for. They're there to pay your mortgage. They're there to hopefully get you health insurance. You know? They're not there to make you feel like you're like the protagonist in some movie and then you get to throw your fist up and the credits roll while victorious music plays. Like that's not real life. So that really readjusted my uh that really readjusted my whole way of thinking that that conversation and and then I eventually got in a sitcom in 2010 and it bombed. Was that and the I, Will Ferrell one? The big Yeah, he produced Lake? it, Big Lake on Comedy Central. It's yeah. kind of this like legendary disaster. Yeah, oh and, yeah. And I got bad reviews and the whole story is yeah, they like, were pretty mean to you. They were oh, unfairly, unfairly. Oh yeah, cuz I also got the job somebody else quit like I had like a week's notice. So then people are blaming me. I'm like, there's a whole team of writers and producers that should share some of this responsibility. I was like, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot yeah. of romance to the idea that, oh, this movie star quit. And then this unknown gets thrown into the call at last minute. It's also indicative of a project that is off the rails a little bit. Maybe not all my fault, but I'll never forget that when that bombed, it did not hurt that much. Um, it certainly stung. 
I certainly wondered if my big chance had come and gone. But I also remember feeling like this should be destroying me. Mm. And it's not. It's a bummer. I'm having some days where I read a bad review and I lay on my couch, but I think anybody would do that. Like, this is not pushing me to a point that's out of control. And I'm someone who historically, it takes a lot less than a bomb sitcom to send me off the fucking deep end. Sure. So I actually was sitting there going, I remember distinctly feeling like this might actually be the start of things. And it turned out it was. Yeah. Because I'd been doing the Chris Gethard show at the UCB theater before that. And it had all this hype. And when I was on that sitcom, I was so dead tired. It was such a ringer that I stopped performing and everything except the Gethard show. I kept the Gethard show going because I was like, that's that is speaking to my soul like that's Mm. that's what's in my guts and it's coming up on stage and i remember when the sitcom bombed almost immediately thinking like i don't even like sitcoms like i don't watch sitcoms so i can't really sit around and be too sad about being on one that bombed because like you couldn't really pay me too much you couldn't really pay me to sit down and watch a full episode of a sitcom like that's not my thing but i almost remember feeling like okay that didn't kill me now it's time to get to work. And that's when all those Jersey instincts kicked back in. I went to public access and uh, started fighting hard for myself. But yeah, sorry, that was a very long-winded answer. Oh, to no, it was, uh, I, that was the awesome. Was. I absolutely love it. Yeah, who cares? That doesn't matter. That's, that's such a beautiful story. Well, I mean, I think it's just, uh, isn't that just such an, an age-old story? You get the thing you want, it isn't what you think. You know, we always just like look to someone else. When I get this, when I get that, it's going to, you know, I look at like people like Bezos and those like Elon Musk, like the billionaires. I'm like, what hole are you still trying to fill? Like, there's no, yeah. there's no number, there's no nothing that is gonna fulfill you. Like, I, I, it, it, happiness is such a fascinating thing to me. Like, I've, especially like the science behind it, and like you know, it, it, it's, it's fascinating. Like, you could, there are people who are homeless and are happy, and there are people who are billionaires and fucking miserable. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, it's all perspective, and it's doing that, that, that inner work. And, you know, and, and, you know, like I said before, like there's not a lot of pop culture crossover and and especially in my line of work or at least where I work, but um, the the two pop culture references that have ever come through from people that just out of the gate blew my fucking mind. I'm like, you know who this is? Was uh, Brene Brown, obviously when she had that big Netflix special, like our supervisors, like we have to watch a call to, I'm like, Oh, it was wonderful. But then it was my, my friend and my supervisor at the time, Nikolai was like, you need to watch this comedy special called career suicide. And it's like, it's all about like mental health. It's like, oh, all right. And then she said it was you. I was like, you know who Chris Gethard is? And she's like, no, no, I just, I saw this. Spe- <laughs> now she, she had no idea who you were, but because it's so rare to see like, you know, comedy like that, like that storytelling. And, and that's honestly one of my favorite specials like that. It's how I was called like that James L. Brooks humor. I like my humor with heart, you yeah. know, like you telling a really sad story, but in a really funny way. Well, yeah, I mean, Judd Apatow produced it, and that makes sense to me because I think he's cut from that same yeah. cloth. But thank you. Yeah, yeah it's uh, I worked very hard on it for years. It was very scary to do, and Berbiglia was the one who really challenged me to do it. Um, mm. Like I'd tell him, he would ask me like, "What's the darkest shit from that era of your life?" And I'd tell him, and he'd be sitting there like la- cackling. <laughs> like tell that on stage. I'm like, Mike, I'm telling you this because I really trust you. I could never tell that on stage. He's like, you have to, you have to see what happens. And it built into the show. And uh, I I was very lucky to do it. I feel intensely proud of it. I feel like I really hope it'll be like in the first paragraph of my funeral, of my obituary rather, you know, like um, there's there's days where I regret it. it, it, You know, it's opened me up to a lot of, other people's pain too, you know, like so hard. Yeah. Yeah. Like you speak secondary trouble. Yeah. And it's like, it's cool. Like I'll go on the road and I'll do stand up, And you know, now my jokes are about like how, you know, what's it like raising my kid? Like this and that here, a weird theme park I went to and people meet me afterwards. And sometimes people go, you know, I watched career suicide and uh, I was actually institutionalized twice and here's the scars on my wrist. And it, it meant a lot and thank you. And I sit, I sit there, I go, thank you. Like, this is beautiful and flattering. And I'm, I'm like insanely happy that I made something that made people feel less alone. 
But then there's also times where I go and I'm doing a weekend in Atlanta where I don't know too many people and now I'm just going to go sit in a hotel room in some like days in and I'm going to think about other people's pain and it's yeah. not always going to be easy. But yeah. I, I don't mean to complain because at the end of the day, it's like, it's probably the thing I'm most proud of that I've ever done. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've actually, I've shown it. So I'm also like, I do drug counseling as well for like people in recovery for like substance use, like especially with behavioral health, there's always a lot of crossover. And I've, I've showed career suicide in like IOP groups for people recovering, like in our little mental health world of like that, that's a special that has made the rounds. And I've worked with so many survivors of uh, people who've made attempts and like the amount of respect you had for like suicide and stuff. Like it's a really, really, really hard topic. And obviously people like me get really defensive and sick and, uh, uh, you know, very defensive about that stuff. And it, it it's, so it, it's one of those things that like, besides it just being hilarious, it hit on such another level, but it is so well regarded in our like mental health community. Oh, thank you. That's like people awesome. who don't even know like comedy, like, well, I, like I'll, any chance I can show it at work, I'm going to show people and like, trust me. Cause you know, you got to laugh. And that's awesome. Yeah. It's, it, when I was working on it, cause I worked on it for years and you can imagine like, there were times where I would do it in the early days and it would play to when I say actual silence, I mean like that was a like 85 minute long show that was played to largely silence for 80 minutes. And like I can bomb now, like I'm used to bombing, but it's particularly hard to bomb when you're talking about stuff that vulnerable. And what would happen though is, is, uh, you know, I'd do these shows and I'd bomb and then there'd be like one person, two, three people waiting for me after the show who'd go, yeah, I've, I've been there too. Or they'd go, you know, oh, my brother, I've been watching him deal with this his whole life. And I really feel like you were kind of saying some stuff that, that reflects where he's been at. And it, it was weird. There'd be times where I'd, I'd, you'd hear like one person laughing really hard and I'd know, oh, that person's completely depressed. Like that person's <laughs> completely fucked in the head. And I know, yeah. and then they'd wait for me afterwards. They'd be like, that was hilarious. I'd be like, all right, we got to get these, we got to get these normals. I got to figure out how to talk to these normals. And ultimately I think that's who the show's for. That's, that was one of the keys in getting it where it needed to go with Oh, this show isn't for other people who have who have dealt with some some of this stuff. They get it. This show is about trying to explain it to the people who, who cannot fathom what this is. And and that kind of, I was like, "Oh, that that is what it is. It's for the people next to the depressed person. Mm. It's yeah, for the it. it's for the depressed it. person's coworker. It's for their dad. It's for their teachers who just don't don't understand so that was that was eye-opening i mean i talked too much i'm sorry oh no please this is what we're, we're all here for people have heard me ramble enough yeah <laughs> what was your was that i can't even imagine like oh god the amount of vulnerability like was that hard to like bring that to your family like hey by the way i'm gonna talk about my suicide attempt i'm not sure if they even knew about it like i've known plenty of people who've made attempts that no one ever knew about well you know, obviously, I, I mean, I tell the story in the show of uh, when I first told my mom that I was feeling suicidal, that was that was one of the hardest nights of my life. Yeah. It wasn't until the show that, they, I mean, they remembered that car crash very, very well. It, it was scary. And uh, I remember, I, I didn't say this in the show, my dad ran down to the scene. Um, or no, wait, no, he didn't. He We went... We went back to that town together to like deal with some of the police stuff. And he, I remember him telling me because he had seen the car afterwards wherever we towed it. And he was like, that's really scary. But they didn't know I did it on purpose. Yeah. Um, so that was really hard for them to reveal that. And then the, uh, you can see me like, getting in my head the first time they saw the show was very 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 difficult very difficult um my mom the night we taped it for hbo my mom gave me this gift just a very small gift but that uh like will always mean the world to me and and had some sentiments 
written out that I'm like, oh, this is, this is like, in a way, me and one of my parents connecting fully on this for the first time. It, it's taken, yeah. you know, 15 years since I told them. Um, and that's not their fault. It's just sometimes that's how that goes. Very often. Very, 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 very often. Yeah, it's much more common than people realize. Like, you know, it's, and it, it's one of those things that cuts across gender, class, and race. It doesn't matter who you are, how much money you have. It's, it's, oh man. Well, I think the next generation, especially for, I love like people like you who have like a voice is like, if you, especially if you listen to like, like the newer artists, like musicians wise, there's such a language now that like kids talk about, like even like the, what is it, like Machine Gun Kelly's new album, which I absolutely love, but like. He's like rapping or singing about like depression it's and feels pop feeling... punk, right? Is he doing a pop punk album? Yeah, now? dude, it's awesome. It's so <laughs> good. You're, it's like, yeah, I'm I'm just dipping my toe back into like the new world of pop punk with the 808s, and it's fucking awesome. And I absolutely, it's it's so it, that moment when you hit, you're like, oh, I'm officially that age where people are going back to my youth. Right. It's just like the Ska is getting big again. That Ska Tune yeah. Network, like that. Oh, Ska's I love yeah. getting cool again. Yeah. Oh, it's cool. Scott Tune Network. And then t- <laughs> uh, my buddy Taylor made that Scott doc, the, what is, um, uh, Pick It Up Scott in the 90s, which was. I'm going to watch that. Oh, it's so good. It's so, yeah, I'm a huge Scott fan as well. And, I'm and write that down. Yeah, oh, yeah. It's, yeah. yeah, he's really nice, dude. Really good guy, too. And then he made another one about Blockbuster that I really loved as well. Oh, that's but, cool. It, but it, yeah, it, it's funny, like, uh, or like listening to these kids, like, it's just like, I don't think I ever heard the term depression, anxiety, or. I, I mean, I had a family member who took took his life when I was younger, but like, I was pretty young. But then no one talked about it ever again. Like, it was like a big, trem- I was very young. It was like a big thing. It was in the news, the whole thing. And then the rest of my life, I don't think my family ever really spoke about it. Or like, can you imagine like your parents talking to you about like self care when you were seventeen? No, I mean, I had a similar thing. First of all, I'm sorry to hear about your family member. Um, that's Ooh, awful. But I had a similar thing where when you know when I first went to a shrink. I imagine this is standard practice where they go, okay, can you, you got to go ask around and see if there's any history of mental illness in your family. Oh yeah. Yeah. I sat down with my mom and she's going, okay, look like, you know, this uncle's on medications for this uncle's on medication. And then the most, the most shocking one, my grandfather who lived across the street from me growing up was put into a mental hospital for, a work-related panic attack. Wow. And then I'm sitting here going, man, like, that would have been really, that would have been really good to know about before all this shit happened. But we, yep. we, we hide it. And, but you know what I will say is I did the show off Broadway in 2016. It was on HBO early 2017. So it's been four or five years. Um, and I actually think when it came out, it felt a little shocking. And I'm really psyched that I think in 2021, it feels like a much less edgy show. Like, I think it yes. probably feels like a little bit more melodramatic or people finding it today might go oh, and roll their eyes a little bit of like, oh, the sad guy. But even, I mean, we're, we're filming this in 2021 or taping this rather in 2021. In 2017, I think it felt like a lot of people turned it on and went, this guy's talking about this shit on TV. And now it yeah. doesn't, now that doesn't feel as shocking. And that's a very, very good thing. It's a very good thing. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Like, I think people still like it and it, it's still funny, but the, the, the value, like, I mean, what, there was a show on Netflix that was popular. What, 13, th- I didn't watch it. 13 Reasons Why? Right. Like, that's all about suicide and like listening to like the like emo rap world stuff, like all these dudes, like they'll talk about like addiction and. And, and especially too, when I work with a younger people, I work with, uh, 18 up, but like when I work with the 18 to 20 year olds, it's just, it's just the link. It's so different. Like I've, I've worked with so many people who are like they're si- in their sixties or seventies and they get bi- di- diagnosed with like bipolar or personality disorder or, or something. And then like, we, you know, sitting talking and they look back at their life like, okay, a lot of this makes sense. Like, yeah. you know, it's like, it's I mean, sad. PTSD didn't even exist. wasn't even a term until what, like. I don't even, I don't know the year, but not that long ago. Yeah. I, I mean, it's like you said, like, you, like Kid Cootie, like Kid Cootie, Kid Cuddy. I, Kid I think Cuddy. Kid Cuddy, like 
he went public and was basically like, hey, I'm going off the grid for a while. I got to go deal with this stuff. You know, like you look at NBA players, I know Kevin Love and I think DeMar DeRozan started opening up like, hey, this is, it's, I, I have to take time off because I can't handle this pressure, you know? And, and uh, that idea, like when we were growing up, the the idea that people from like rap felt like an ultra masculine thing the world of sports felt mm-hmm. like an ultra masculine thing so yeah. the idea that people in those worlds are opening up about this stuff and that it's getting kind of respected and taken seriously is uh i look at it and i go oh god forbid my son deals with any of this it's my greatest fear god forbid but at the very least like He's not he's not going to feel like it's like if you're admitting to this stuff that you're somehow like undercutting your own like quote unquote masculinity. Like we're getting to a point where we're all going like, well, who, maybe we can get over like the fucking John Wayne cowboy World War II movie vision of being an American male and like just fucking sort our shit out. Sorry to curse so much, but I love it. Makes me happy. Makes me happy to see all these people that are from walks of life where historically you can't let your guard down in that way. Like, you know, for me growing up, who was it? It was like Morrissey, Blake Schwarzenbach. Like who else? Who else we got did made, we have? We got, I don't know about you, but like I got made fun of in my own scene for like liking emo, like being made fun of like for like, for liking these, for like, yeah, liking those bands and stuff. And it was like, what? I don't understand it. All music's emotional. Like yeah. I'm like, like that's like when Thursday hit, like I, when New Brunswick again, Thursday was like, Oh my, like when Screamo hit, I remember like my friends like giving me so much guff for it. I'm like, what do you, what do you mean? I, I don't understand. Like it was so weird. And then and especially, oh God. you think back too, and I'm like, you know what? One of the bands that helped me most in high school was like minor threat. Mm-hmm. Listen to a lot of their shit. I would say there's a lot of emotions on the sleeve of like the yeah. world's fucked up. I don't fit in. Everybody's like pressuring each other all the time to like live in this way. That's like, so cookie cutter and destructive and i'm just not gonna do it and i have to scream as loud as i can about how the fact that i don't live that way and i have ethics and i have morals and and i think the world is completely fucking bonkers like that had a huge effect on me but nobody's gonna make fun of that band because they they're hard they're a hardcore band you know like tough you have to be tough and then you can hide your sentiments you know but um i know what you mean of like oh you're being so emo it's like okay Maybe, or maybe I'm finding something that's making me actually feel uh, uh, not, uh, you know, like I'm not completely lonely for the 33 minute duration of this album. Yep. Maybe, maybe that could, maybe we could just think about it that way. I used to Chilling. love going to hardcore shows because it was like, all right, I can get some aggression out. And then some of those bands I listened back to, I'm like, they were terrible. Just let it um, chug a chug a do, 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 It's do, tough. Do. Like, I've been, I've talked with friends about this where I'm like, man, like S- Southern California hardcore. When I started listening, you know, you go through these waves where you revisit stuff. I'm like, oh, this mm-hmm. stuff holds up. Like, Descendants, Black Flag, like all this stuff. Yeah. This is awesome. DC hardcore, Minor Threat, a lot of stuff that's around it. I'm like, this is really good. New York hardcore, which obviously in North Jersey was the one we're most connected to. I'm like, I go back to listen to it and I'm like, this music is un- unlistenable. Like, <laughs> uh, and I knew it. In high I, yeah, I get that. I remember, like, I remember in high school, uh, having like a conscious moment where it was like, I have the youth of today seven inch. I got the Gorilla Biscuit seven inch, and I want so bad to like it because I would love to be one of those guys. But like, yep, I cannot pretend even at sixteen. Like I cannot pretend that I enjoy putting this seven inch on. I think I'm. I think I gotta just own the fact that I'm a Mr. T experience guy. Let's go with that. <laughs> I yeah. Uh, I, I remember like, getting arguments with people. I'm like, I just really need melody. I just yeah. I need it. I really need melody. And and then like, you know, I like fall in love like saves the day and be like, oh, they ripped off Lifetime and hardcore. And then I'm like, I don't. I mean, I know all that or whatever. But like, it's like. I guess Saves the Day is like kind of hardcore. Like to me, it was always just like perfect pop perfection. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Lifetime because for some reason, it's funny Lifetime because I was in New Brunswick just as they were wrapping up, 
And I remember it being like they were just a local band that played a million shows. Like I always remember seeing them. On the, uh, but there's other bands I remember where their names are just as common. And uh, they've become like so legendary since that yeah. time. And I've been going back for some reason in the pandemic the last month or two. I just keep listening to Jersey's Best Dancers. And I'm like, oh, this is like I always I always liked Lifetime. Their cover of New England was actually how I found Billy Bragg. Like nice. back in the day, like I, I and Billy Bragg's one of my like true near and dear to my heart artists. But I've been listening. I'm like, oh, this album is like so much better than I remembered it. It's so much better. And again, like like your friends, oh, I can we can make fun of Saves the Day because they dialed up the pop aspect of it. But Lifetime is literally making songs about like you know, I made you cry too many times, but because mm -hmm. the drums pound in a certain way, oh, we can still like that and be tough. It's like, I bet even the members of Lifetime would be like, you're pretty, this is pretty dumb. It's pretty dumb to get mad at people for liking the things they like. I know it's, it's so fun, especially in music. I, I feel like I've been doing that too. A lot of like going back to that music and like, especially with like what Jay, um, Jay Vix has been doing with like the corn tunes and the New Jersey pop punk Facebook yeah, group. It's yeah. like, like I, oh, but your Western cover, by the way, was excellent. Oh, thank you. I I really I, I I didn't know you could sing. I can't. I was like, I can't. If you listen to the song, you know I can't. But thank you. No, yeah. I want. I was watching you on uh, YouTube doing at the fest doing the uh, Morrissey with the uh, the Morrissey set from whatever. Oh, that was. with Mikey and uh, I think yeah. the fest when we had Joe with us too. Was it John or Joe that played that? Yeah, one? Mikey Erg was on the drums. Mikey was on the drums. My friend Alex was on guitar, and then. We've had John, who plays with Jeff Rosenstock on bass, and then we had Joe Keller on bass uh, a couple yeah. of shows. And uh, those guys, those bass lines, I didn't realize because my wife, Hallie, um, who some uh, the punk fans might know as Hallie Unlovable, she plays bass. And I was like, oh, you should, we're getting the band together to do the Smiths covers. I'm like, you should play the bass. She's like, those bass lines are so hard. Listen to Smiths' bass lines. And then right. to see John and Joe, who are like really like, they can play and to see them like have fun going like neither one of them were really big Smiths fans. And then they're going, Oh, but it's so fun to try to wrap our heads around what the fuck is going on with these bass lines. And that was cool. That was cool. Who, who played with uh Rosenstock? Was it John? John, you said? John, yeah. John D. D. Dominici. Yeah. Yeah. So I, um, man, his first band, Arison, arrogant sons of bitches yeah. was our like home. Well, they were from long Island, but our friends in Connecticut had a label, um, Andy was in the Flaming Tsunamis. They had killed. They signed. They they signed ASOB. So like getting to spend, like looking back and spending like my senior years getting to see like a young baby Jeff Roganson stock, and then what he's done is just like so cool. Yeah. And he he's been that like I don't I don't know him anymore. Like we were chummy back in the day, but like that's always been him. Like he, I remember I've nice seen guy. yeah, and like I remember would see him on a Sunday. I, mean, I have very vivid memory. It was a Sunday afternoon show at the DAV in Meriden, Connecticut, where I'm, where I'm from. I think there was nine people there and fucking a arrogant sons of bitches. His old ska band was playing and fucking Jeff, like picked up the podium, put it in the front, climbed on top of it. And then like hung the microphone over something and was just like giving 170% to like the nine of us in the merch guy and That's the other awesome. bands. And that never changed. I've seen yeah. him playing gazebos, and it's, it's, it's so funny. Awesome. I because uh, I knew Bomb. I was like aware of Bomb, had heard a bunch oh, of their Bomb. stuff. But I can't lie and say that I was like a Bomb fanatic, like many are. Um, I like them, but yeah. I, I I mean I really like them. Um, and and like I said, knew of them, knew their stuff, liked it, knew it was good, but wasn't like diehard. And then we had Laura Stevenson play my old public access show, and she and I. Uh, became like pen pals, like email pen pals. Cause I actually was not able to make that show that night. And then I emailed her apologizing and we just kept writing back and forth and realized, Oh, we really get along. And then after like four email exchanges, she was like, I'm going to, I'm going to get my, you have to hang out with Jeff. She's like, you and Jeff think the same way about a lot of stuff. You guys need to meet. You'd be, and we've been fast friends ever since he's, uh, he's been very, very kind to me over the years and gives great advice. Great advice. <laughs> Do you listen to the Chris the Makes podcast? Oh, I have on occasion. Yeah, the the I just listened to Jeff's episode about Scram, and um, which no, not Scram. Um, oh my god, I forgot the song. 
Yeah, whatever. Uh, I'll forget the name of it. But anyway, it would, ended up being him writing a song about uh, his friend that was murdered, and that was part of like our, our our mutual friend in our scheme. And I remember that happening. And that like now that it hit me, I just learned this recently. Like it hit me in such a different. That song just hit me in such a different way. I was like, damn. Well, was that nausea? Yes, nausea. Yeah, it yeah, was about I um, him telling me that Mitch being murdered, and yeah, it was. Terrible. Now that I knew him. It was terrible. Was that that home invasion in Connecticut? Yeah, uh, I think I know you're referring. You're probably thinking one in Connecticut. Uh, you're probably referring to the one in Cheshire. But this was I just heard like about a that, yeah, yeah. No, this was like Mitch. I knew him. I was more friends with his roommate Andy, who played in Flame and Tsunamis and and had to kill normal. But like, uh, I think someone literally knocked at the door. Mitch answered. They just walked in, murdered, and left. And I think it was later found out like gang gang initiation. But it was it just. It just struck a chord for all of us. And like, I love that song. And then hearing him talk about it, like I was like listening to that podcast, like by myself, like almost in tears. I was like, Oh my God, what are you doing to me, Jeff? Yeah. Bastard. That's uh, yeah. When you listen, that song's so catchy and it went everywhere. And it's, then you actually listen to the lyrics and you're like, Oh, this is, this is about it. So sad. So sad. Such a I, sad I know it, it's, it's so funny. Cause I, I, I was saying this, like you're one of those people, like, you seem to have like a foot in all of the little weird niche things that I absolutely love. Like, I think you might be the only person in like that NJ pop punk group that would also be a, that is also like, you know, I'm like, I'm a huge blank. I'm a blankie as well. So it's like, I bet not many people in that group know what blank check is. And I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure most people who listen to blank check have no idea what punk rock is. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think there's probably a lot of truth to that. A lot of truth to that. That fan, my relationship with that fan base is is very layered and funny because they they half love me and half hate me for playing the heel sometimes. But uh, I do enjoy them a lot. And the David, and, David and Griffin oh, yeah. are just I like love it. Yeah. the nicest it, people. Yeah, Griffin, such a he. I got to interview him actually right at the beginning of the pandemic. He uh, he was he came on here and we uh, we, we were set it up whatever we're talking and then my daughter started throwing up so run downstairs to take care of her like we start talking again like maybe 20 minutes in and then she throws up again and i come back upstairs and like hey he's like hey man do you want to just reschedule your kid's sick just don't worry about it i was like oh oh, okay in my head i was like all right i got a half hour he's no need you know he he doesn't owe me anything he's he's griffin newman and literally then two weeks later like we did it again and he came back and gave me and we uh, just like yeah I'll never boy. forget that. He's like the that's sweetest boy. Yeah, I was like, you don't even know me, and <laughs> it's just it was it's one of those like little moments like in the the years of doing this. I'm like, I'll never forget that too because I was like, so you know, you do a po- you do many podcasts like that moment of like you finally get the guest and then something goes wrong and you're like, all right, I blew my shot, it's over, never gonna happen again. And I then I couldn't believe it. I hear you. Yeah, you're you're the reason I walk around my house yelling uh, Babu Frick to this day. Yeah, Babu Frick. Kit Babu Fisto. Frick. I know every once in a while I'll be at a, like a, I'll do stand up and somebody will come up to me in a random city and just be like, "Give me that Fisto," and I'm like, "Oh, you like the Blank Check podcast? That's cool. I like it too." Yeah, yeah, I because I, I my brother my brother's a huge fan of it. I never listened to it, and then I watched the Tick, and just fell in love with the Tick. And then my brother's like, "Oh, Griffin's got this podcast," and then just fucking deep dive that shit. Yeah, yeah, it's really great. It's, it's really so, great. Him and David are, uh, and they, they, I, I believe they met because of the Chris Gethard show. No way. That would make sense. Yeah. Cause Griffin was like, Griffin has given me a lot of credit. He used to come see me at UCB when he was like 16. He mm. really clicked with my wavelength and he used to make a point to come see me in shows. And then over the years we just, you know, he started doing more and more. Our circle started to cross paths and, he was a very huge supporter of the Gethard Show and fan. He actually started running a fan podcast. And David had written this review in the AV Club of our show that when I, I, I it made a, it did so much good for us. It's it's probably a big reason why we went to cable was because mm. he gave us this glowing write up. So they Griffin interviewed him for the podcast, and I believe that's when they realized how hard they click and started working together. Don't quote me on it, but I think that's where they first met. Oh, that's so cool and. I just saw on Twitter that day. I, it's, I'm sure you know. It's like you build that like parasocial relationship. And like I know I don't know them, but like when I fa- I saw on Twitter that David was going to be a dad, I was like, oh my god! As a fellow dad, I was like, oh my god! Yeah, it's congratulations! Awesome. It's super and, cool. 
I'm yeah. sorry, I'm getting, you see me getting distracted. There's a giant bug in my window, and I can't tell oh. if it's inside or outside. Oh, I hate that feeling. I think it's I, inside. And I think the thing I love, and I th- and then you got Ben. I think Ben is like the my, the part. Of, like I always feel like I I don't have that level of knowledge of film. Like I I like movies. Like I'm upset, deeply obsessive with like punk rock and and, and yeah. stuff. Like I don't have that with film. And then 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 every once in a while, Ben will drop a jersey, like a, a jersey fan reference, and like it's like yes, it all comes together. He's the voice, he's your voice on there. Yeah, he's the friendly he's, ear. Yeah, he's so fucking funny. Like I can't even take it sometimes. <laughs> That dude kills me. It's it, it's such a fun sh- and uh, and oh my god, the blank check people, the the fans like that was, god, like two hundred plus episodes in, and that was one of the nicest fan bases. I've I've never gotten so much like blow up from talking to him for yeah, Griffin. Like everyone, was, people. everyone was so nice. Like the Reddit and all and all those Twitter. Like they, it was just like damn, that was, that was nuts. Oh wow! Shit, it's already been an hour. Yeah. Look at that! Time flies, baby. Time. Flies. I love it. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I, I mean, I I was actually joking around. Like I was like, I don't know what to bring up because there's like seven bajillion things, and I'm sure you get, <laughs> but you don't want to ask like the same stuff. So and like I'm like, well, it's my the way I always think of when I do my interviews. I'm like, well, what do I want to hear? Because it's my time. <laughs> yeah. And. I'm sure you probably get asked more about like the office and parks and rec. Cause that's what everyone I knew like in my life. And I was like, Oh, I'm doing this with Chris Gethard. I'm so excited. I've been a fan for years. They're like, Oh, he was on the office. And in my head, I'm like, yeah, that's like what one, how many times were we on? Like one Two or twice. Yeah. And the later seasons, yeah. I hope they bring you on for office ladies though. I don't know if you're listening to that podcast. Uh, yeah, it's great. And I did my scenes with Angela and she was so sweet. Um, I've, so yeah, I, I hope, but that they have to get all the way to season nine for that to happen. So. Yeah. You got some time on that one. <laughs> That's so crazy. Oh man. Well, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I, I can't thank you enough for uh, doing this. Uh, but so like, if there's anything we missed, if not, like, uh, where can people find you and all your wonderful projects on the internet? I mean, Chris is my, my website. And then I'm on all the social media stuff. And the, uh, you know, the thing that I'm, that I'm really jazzed on right now is this New Jersey is the world podcast where it's just me and two guys who are just guys I grew up with. Like, uh, you know, neither of them are comedians. One of them is like an actual card carrying union construction guy in Jersey. And we just tell a lot of the stories of our youth and they are very, very funny gentlemen. And, uh, yeah. I would love oh if people, God. I would love if people checked it out. It's like Sopranos without the crime. It is. It's, a uh, like you said, New Jersey, New Jersey's just like a real, real, like, everything's jammed together in a way that leads to a lot of madness. And I think even if you're not particularly interested in New Jersey, there's just a lot of funny stories coming out of this one. So it would be nice if people checked it out. Absolutely. Oh, actually one last thing I do want to ask you, have you ever been, when I, when I worked at that summer camp in like some like Sussex County, there was a town or like a little community that was for, I don't for correct. Forgive me if I'm I don't know the right word for it, but, um, uh, little people is that the right word? I no, just no, there's learned a few of these. I heard there's a few okay. of these around New Jersey. Yeah, we used to go to it, and there was, and I was just, and everyone there was like, it was in this, it was like the, and that this was, was always so weird to me about New Jersey because it was like there's this, be- there was this one town that D- Derek Jeter owned a home in. I forgot the name of it, like West Milford, maybe something like that little area, like that area. And then next to it was where all like, there was a village of like little people and no one there except me thought it was strange. Like I didn't, not like bad. I was like, wait, what? They're like, yeah, yeah you, you, you don't have a total. Well, there's one in Edgewater. There's these, all these communities with little houses and there's rumors. I think the one you're thinking of, it's, it's not in Sussex. It's on the border of the, in Jefferson township. Yes. There's yes. stories that the Ringling brothers used to camp all their performers there. And that some of the yes. houses are tiny because they were built for little people performers. Yes. Yes. That's um, exactly what so it is. Yes, I have heard of it, and no, to Jersey people, it's not that shocking. Yeah, no, it's it uh, always to my mind. Thank you so much, and have a good rest of your day. This podcast is a proud member of the Let's Chat Club. Find out how you can become a member by going to the website letschatpodcast.net. dot <laughs> net.